Healthy coral reefs can be stunningly beautiful and play a critical role in coastal ecosystems. They harbor a tremendous diversity of marine life and contribute to the overall health of the world's oceans and their coastlines. A quarter of all marine species depend on them for survival. They're also important to humans. Often located in shallow water, they can protect coastal communities from damaging storm surges. And the reefs host a primary sustainable food source for hundreds of millions of people around the world. But as the oceans warm, corals are struggling to survive. Excessive heat drives away the microscopic algae the coral depend on. That leads to a dramatic loss of color known as coral bleaching, a powerful visual indicator of an unhealthy reef. But bleaching isn't the only indicator of a reef in peril. Not only it looks brown and is lacking these beautiful, vibrant colors, but it just sounds dead. That's where sensory biologist Aaron Mooney comes in. My background is in hearing and in bioacoustics, and I study how animals perceive the world around them. Coral reefs are kind of rainforests of the sea, and just like a really rich forest, might have a lot of birds calling, and you might hear the monkeys calling in the background. Coral reefs are really the same. So basically, a healthy coral reef has a really healthy, rich soundscape. Snapping shrimp, lobster, and fish create a symphony indicative of a biodiverse community. And a degraded coral reef is just impoverished soundscape. It sounds quiet, kind of desolate. So by listening to the soundscape, we can kind of track that biodiversity and understand when that change is happening. Off the coast of St. John in the Caribbean, a team from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Massachusetts conducts bleaching surveys, finding evidence of degraded reefs. To your right, there's some bleached coral. You knew there was going to be bleaching here, right? But then it's freaking everywhere, right? I've been coming here five, six years now. This was the first time I've seen such bleaching. Yogi Gurdar is a roboticist and computer scientist at Woods Hole. I'm working on robots and AI and machine learning based techniques to understand uh, complex ecosystems in the ocean, such as coral reefs. A question they pose, is it possible to build a robot that can seek out and find healthy reefs on its own? If they succeed, the robot could provide an efficient and cost-effective way to find healthy coral reefs, map them, and monitor their health. The soundscapes recorded by the robot could be a vital tool in diagnosing reef health and tracking decline or improvement. Good job, team. The team has been collecting data on reefs for over a decade. I see you're going through this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We might be able to thread it through here. They have mountains of information, including audio and video. They've even created 3D models of the reefs for further study. Helping them gather this data is this third generation robot. We call it Curie, C-U-R-E-E, -E, uh, which stands for Curious Underwater Robot for Ecosystem Exploration. It's equipped with sensors, microphones, and cameras, and is still very much under development. The design of a robot is always evolving. Our robot is never finished. It's an engineering challenge with a lot of moving parts. So they've broken it down into many small steps. There are many, many problems that you can solve with an engineering solution, but I think you have to really understand what the problem is and sort of pick the two or three that really you want to address. Otherwise, you kind of fall into this trap of trying to solve all the problems all at once and you run out of resources. This morning, the team is prepping for its latest test right off the dock. All right, Dr. Gerthard, you ready? Always. I'll uh, manage the tether. Got it. To start, they'll place a speaker on the ocean floor, playing a recording of a healthy coral reef. 
a sound file they captured from a previous trip. Should be on. All right. Hear it. They're hoping the robot will recognize the sound through the water and be able to record it. In this outing, the robot is not moving autonomously. Researcher Seth McCammon is operating the robot remotely to steer and position it for the test. I'm getting it in line with the thing so he can start to look at the data. Mm -hmm. So if the robot doesn't work, but this sound is probably not going to work on the real coral reef. So it's a good, good test. Experimenting with sound underwater is not a new idea. In the 1800s, a Swiss physicist and a French mathematician armed with a bell and stopwatch measured the speed at which sound traveled underwater. On one side of Lake Geneva, Charles Francois Stern rang a submerged bell while Jean-Daniel Colladon used a long tube to listen underwater across the lake, pressing his stopwatch to keep track of how long it took the sound to travel across. Surprisingly, they found that water is a better conduit for sound than air. Sound travels through water roughly five times faster. Today, the Woods Hole team will be using the speed of sound underwater as part of their calculations. The robot is equipped with four microphones designed for underwater use, called hydrophones. As the sound from the speaker speeds through the water in all directions, it reaches the hydrophones at slightly different times, just milliseconds apart. The researchers look at a computer display that shows the signals recorded on each hydrophone. And so it'll hit one hydrophone before the others. And by looking at the relative time of arrival at those different hydrophones, we can figure out which direction it came from first and then steer the robot in that direction. The robot correctly identifies the direction of the sound, an important first step toward autonomous navigation. A small but important victory. It's like you're building out of Legos and you're building up a house brick by brick by brick. And it only works when the house is fully done, but you need to know that each single brick in that works on its own in isolation before you're willing to add it to the larger picture. And so you have this massive goal that you're trying to achieve, but there needs to be attainable goals along the way because ultimately you're dealing with a system of components, a system of elements that need to work together in order for this to be successful. Curie is ready to step up to a bigger challenge, locating an actual healthy reef by sound, something less predictable than what the speaker provided. One of the healthier reefs in St. John is in nearby Joel's Shoal. I propose that we drop the robot like 20 meters. We're like 10 meters off the reef right now. They'll place Curie approximately 20 meters from the reef. To succeed, it just needs to orient itself toward the sound. Robot going in. All right, cast away. So the test today is mostly just trying to figure out if the robot can accurately determine which direction the reef sound is in. It's a more complex test. This time, Curie is untethered, and the boat is drifting with the ocean current. If they lose contact, they could easily lose the robot entirely and all of the engineering that went into it. When they began to design this autonomous robot that would go underwater, there is a need to make sure that this thing is able to behave in an environment where, if it doesn't, we can retrieve it. Curie locates the direction of the healthy reef. Which is encouraging. It's another successful test. The next big hurdle, can Curie not only locate, but then move toward a healthy reef autonomously? This will be a crucial milestone in the mission which is to ultimately build a fleet of robots to map, monitor, and record the health of corals around the globe. While reefs are under serious threat all over, there are some signs of hope and some surprising ideas for ways to protect them, including one that came from this team's research. 
In their work, they discovered that the sound of a healthy reef might actually have an indirect healing effect on a stressed reef. It has to do with the coral animal's life cycle. Newly born baby corals, tiny larvae, drift in the ocean, searching for somewhere to settle. It turns out the sound of a thriving coral reef signals them to settle into place. Once they find a spot, they can be very resilient and grow for centuries. So the more larvae a reef can attract, the healthier it will be. And that gave the team an idea. We know these reefs are degraded, and we want to rebuild them by attracting the larvae, the baby coral. In a past experiment, the team found that larvae could be drawn to recordings of healthy reefs. So by placing speakers in strategic locations, they could give a boost where it's needed most. And that system actually leverages the healthy soundscape and plays it back into the environment. And the idea is that it induces coral larvae to kind of choose that environment and settle. The result? Up to seven times more larvae settlement compared to a degraded reef without the audio boost. A very encouraging sign. But back to St. John and Curie. The team is ready for the final test of the day. The robot's going to use the direction that it's finding from its hydrophones and then drive itself to whatever the nearest acoustic source is, which we're hoping is going to be Joel Shoal Reef. This time, since Curie will pilot itself, it's tethered for safety. They put Curie in the water and give it the green light. Are we expecting it to be moving or not? We are. It looks at first as though it's orienting toward the sound of the reef. It thinks it's moving. But after a few minutes, it's clear that Curie isn't making much headway. It's just dumb stuff in the way that I wrote. It seems there's an issue with the software. All right, bring it back. Coming up. I can now see it. They're starting to lose the light. Being dark. They weren't able to check off everything on the day's to-do list, yet they remain upbeat. Well, we're all happy right now because uh, we ended the day with as many robots as we started the day with. It's frustrating in the moment, but they're making progress. The creative act of engineering has got Disappointment has got failure, and that's how we learn. So it is a big ball of, of um, two steps forward and one step back. When you have a, a very massive why and a very massive purpose for what you're trying to do, such as save the coral reefs, it allows you to experience the disappointment, but not be defeated by it, and continue to try the process of moving it forward. If you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. Yeah, it's very frustrating, but when it works, it's very satisfying. Engineering solutions to the climate crisis will require creativity, innovation, and a global commitment to making smart choices. <laughs>